some familiar names. Me too. <laughs> it's definitely weird not seeing other people. <laughs> yep. Chat, guys. Hello. Happy. Welcome, Thank welcome. Thank you for doing this with us. Sure. Yeah. yeah, we're just waiting for our students to kind of filter in here. But thank you so much okay. for, for spending time with us, Clarissa. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for having me. Sorry, forgive me. I'm just putting my earrings on because I realized <laughs> that I had taken them off. <laughs> coming in. Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for spending time with us here today. Uh, for those of you that don't, that don't know me, my name is Maria Carter Giannini. I'm one of the AP US History teachers here at Mountain View, and we're being joined with the student responsible for organizing this, Alex Rousseau, uh, one of our AP students here. So we're really excited about this and a very hearty welcome to Ms. Clarissa Ward from CNN, who's been so gracious to come and answer some questions for us today. So do you want to start by telling us what you do at CNN? Because <laughs> I think when people hear Chief CNN International Correspondent, they're kind of like, what does that mean? What does that mean? No, it's a good question. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's always a delight to talk to the next generation of journalists. Um, well, I hope some of you might consider becoming journalists. Um, I know Alix maybe is thinking about it. Um, so I'm, yes, I'm CNN's chief international correspondent. And basically that means I cover the world for CNN. Anything that happens outside of America um, could be something that I would be covering. And that can run the gamut from war in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, to uh, natural disasters in Indonesia, um, tsunamis in Japan, uh, riots. I mean, you name it, if there's a big story uh, that is taking place outside of the US, the chances are that I will be covering it. And so it's a great job. It's a really tough job. It entails a lot of travel, a lot of um, extremely dangerous situations. I mean, obviously you really try to avoid that to the best of your ability, but if you're covering war and you're going to a lot of very hostile environments, then there are risks associated. And so um, I love it and I wouldn't change it for the world, but it's not necessarily for everyone. <laughs> and so how did you find your way into journalism? So, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. I, I thought when I was younger that I wanted to be an actress and I was really into theater. And, and then in my senior year of college, I was studying comparative literature at Yale and 9-11 happened. And honestly, it kind of blows my mind that you guys don't really, well, yeah, you you didn't know the world before 9-11. And it, it, it was a really different world and it felt very different. And I think for all of us who lived through that moment, it was a life-changing moment. And it was a moment where you really questioned what you've been doing with your life. And I think many of us felt drawn to some kind of service whatever that service might look like. For some, it was going and joining the military. For me, it was going to the ends of the earth to understand why this had happened and how it could have happened and what we didn't understand about the world and what the world didn't understand about us. And a sort of commitment, if you like, to this idea of acting as a translator between different worlds. Because one of the things that started me on this journey and that I now feel so 
clear about after all these years of experience doing it is that people are people no matter where they live in the world no matter what god they pray to no matter they're they're human beings they're people and there is always a way to connect there is always a way to find common ground there is always a way to to understand and have a deeper and more nuanced perception of the other so that is um that's basically what got me into journalism 9-11 what is one or two or three pieces of advice that you have for students that are interested in getting into journalism? I mean, so the first piece of advice that I always give people, because sometimes I meet young journalists or aspiring journalists who really seem to be very clear on the fact that they want to be on television, um, but less clear on like whether they're actually really interested in journalism. So the first thing I say is like, you have to be curious. And curiosity is not something, generally speaking, that you can fake or force. Like it needs to be authentic. It needs to be real. You need to be that person. Like maybe you're even nosy. I don't know. I've always been, I think, a bit nosy. Um, I just want to know what's going on. And I want to know what motivates people. Um, and I'm always asking. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've sat down at a dinner party and the person sitting next to me is like, oh my gosh, I kind of feel like I'm being interviewed. And I'm like, no, you're not. I just want to know everything about you. I like, I want to know what drives you. I want to know what motivates you. I want to know what you hate. Like, I'm not interested in talking about the weather with you, really. I want to like, let's get to the good stuff. So I think you have to be curious about all different kinds of people and places and and then beyond that, you need to be highly motivated. It's an incredibly competitive field, journalism, and it's becoming more and more so, which is delightful because honestly, we need as many great journalists as we can get. We're living in really scary times at the moment and the whole idea of truth and fact is being called into question. So I really think that journalists perform a hugely important um, civic duty but that means that it's really hard. Like a lot of young people want to do it and you got to be willing to go that extra mile if you really want to make it happen. So especially if you want to do what I do, which is already a little bit niche. I did Christmas in Baghdad. I did Christmas in Afghanistan. I did Christmas in Russia. I, you know, I, you, you, you gotta be, I worked overnights. I learned languages. I lived in different places all over, like, and you, that's what you need to be willing to do. I'll never forget one young aspiring journalist who was sort of like, I think I want to be a journalist. And I was like, okay, like, what are you interested in? What stories are you interested? In? Where would you like to be um, based? Or have you thought about what area is particularly compelling to you? And she was like, I really like Paris. And I was like, oh my, I was like, <laughs> First of all, who doesn't like Paris, okay? Like everybody likes Paris. <laughs> that doesn't mean you should be a journalist, okay? So if there's those of you in the class who are like, wait, I like Paris, should I be a journalist? No, not necessarily. That is not, um, that is not a precursor to, to being a great journalist. But if you're motivated and you're excited about learning more about the world and you feel that you're a curious person, or some people are also motivated a lot by like a sense of righteousness or justice. Like it's very exciting, the idea of being able to hold people in power accountable for their actions or call people out in lies. Um, when, you know, very often people in power tell like monumental lies or cover up atrocities. And, and there is something really satisfying in being able to play some small part in exposing that. So yeah, but you gotta have the grit to make it happen. I was gonna say as a French American saying, I wanna go to Paris is, sounds very cliche. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> but, uh, and and speaking of curiosity, if, if any students if, or teachers that are in here as well, if anyone has questions, the Q&A is open and we will uh, hopefully have time to answer some of those near the end. So feel free to start putting some questions in the Q&A section. To follow up that question, um, so what have been some of your most memorable moments throughout your career that have stood out to you? I mean, there's so many. There's so many. I mean, you've read my book, right? Um, I did. <laughs> and, and actually, you know, not just to be like shamelessly plugging my book, but 
even if you're not super interested in journalism, I think it's a very accessible book. I think it's, even though it's heavy in parts, it's kind of a fun read too. And you get to travel around the world on some of the adventures that I've had in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, China, Russia, and other places. Um, so, I mean, the stories that really stand up were covering the tsunami in Japan because I've never seen a natural disaster like that. I've never seen just entire towns eviscerated, wiped off the map, just gone. Um, and it's very intense working in a place that is, first of all, that consumed by shock and grief, but secondly, you don't know where you can sleep. You don't know where you can get food. There's no electricity, there's no gas. So it's incredibly challenging logistically. I think sometimes people just look at the finished product with journalism you look at like the nice polished piece on television and what you don't see and this is part of why I wrote a book is like everything that's happening behind the scenes both in terms of like everything it takes to get that piece on television and also in terms of like all the beautiful moments of connection that happen with people you meet along the way that don't make it onto the evening news but really shape the way you see the world the story that broke my heart in a hundred pieces and, and, you know, continues to haunt me, honestly, is the story of the Syrian civil war, which has now basically been won by President Bashar al-Assad, who is a man who has brutalized his own people um, beyond anything we've really seen in, in, in the last, certainly in the last decade that I can think of. He's killed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of his own people to try to quash this rebellion that really started out as a kind of peaceful democratic uh, aspirational movement of people who are fed up with living in a police state under a corrupt dictatorship. And gradually the rebellion morphed into something very different and it did get really ugly and really complex. Um, but still all the way through, we had this sort of David and Goliath dynamic where you had like this regime of Bashar al-Assad with huge amounts of, of support from Russia, from Iran with like tanks and, and an air force and, you know, using barrel bombs, which are like these homemade bombs. You just take a barrel and stuff it with nails and explosives and then you just roll it out of the back of a helicopter over a civilian neighborhood. And it's absolutely devastating. So you had that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you had a rebellion, which is like a bunch of guys with, you know, very little military training and lightly armed with AK-47s. And when I was with some of these groups, they didn't even have two-way radios. So it was always a very unmatched, uneven fight. But the other thing that was different about Syria is that normally as a war correspondent, you go to the front line during the day and then you kind of pull back a bit and you can go to a hotel and there's other journalists usually in the hotel and you might call your loved ones if you have a chance or you work, but you have that little pause, um, that little space of like detachment. And you didn't have that in Syria because it was the areas that were under rebel held control. You couldn't stay in a hotel or weren't hotels. So you were living in people's homes and you were there when their family members died. And there was no question of like stepping away or stepping outside or taking a moment to yourself. Like you were front and center living vicariously through them, experiencing profound grief, shock, horror, death, loss in a very intimate and up close and personal way. And I had never experienced a war that intimately and it was heartbreaking. When you see those people that are living out every day from front line to front line. Um, do you think that one day President Bashar al-Assad will be condemned by the International Criminal Court or? You know, I mean, the issue is like, no, probably not because the problem is he has very powerful supporters and in the form of like the UN Security Council, he has Russia on side and he has China on side. Um, China's not really like fully on side, but China is on side with a very key and important issue, which is that there should never be regime change through revolution or through uprising or through the will of the people, right? Um, because obviously they're concerned about their own self-preservation. 
So as long as there are leaders like that of important superpowers who are willing to do anything they can to protect Bashar al-Assad, not because they care about him and not because they're not cognizant of the horrific war crimes he's responsible for, but because of what he represents, right? Then it's very difficult to envision a scenario in which he does have to face stresses. At the same time, there is an extraordinary amount of evidence to, um, to, to put him away for forever. Um, and not just him, we saw in Germany recently, a Syrian who was responsible for what he would do in Syria is he would like gather up revolutionaries and then he would drive them basically to the local, like uh, not the police station, but like the Shabiha, like the thugs who worked for Bashar al-Assad or the Mukhabarat, the secret services, and he would hand them over and then they would be tortured and killed. Well, he was spotted in Germany by several other refugees who recognized him from Syria. And they went to the German authorities and they were like, this is what this guy was doing in Syria. And the Germans, to give them credit, arrested him. And he was put on trial and he was just sentenced to four and a half years for his role. Like he wasn't participating in the beatings himself, but he obviously was facilitating them. So he was sentenced. And that to me is very encouraging because it's very rare that you that you see people in war ever really be held responsible for their actions. The regime of Bashar al-Assad was sort of unique in that almost like the Nazis, they liked to keep a record of their uh, of their killings, of their massacres. So in these prisons, they would take pictures of these bodies that have been tortured to death and, and like in great detail go into what the injuries were and what the person had died of. And, um, take photographs of it. And all of that has been smuggled out by a very, very brave Syrian who's known only as Caesar, who actually was working in the prison and smuggled out, you know, thousands and thousands of documents that potentially will ensure that even if Bashar al-Assad never has to face a judge and a jury or the International Criminal Court, he will never be um, accepted um, in, in any uh, Western society, certainly. Uh, and I think there's probably a very good chance that one day he'll be assassinated in his own country. There's certainly plenty of people who, uh, who would like to kill him. And so with that, what do you think the most, in, um, the, like challenges that come with reporting those types of stories? I mean, there's so many different challenges. There's challenges logistically. How do you get to these places, right? It was impossible for people to go into the, um, the li liberated Syrian territories because, um, because the Assad regime didn't want that and they weren't giving visas. And if you did have a visa, you couldn't leave their areas. And so, you know, most of us journalists ended up just going to Turkey and smuggling ourselves through that border. And that became the only way to do it. And obviously that has risks that are associated with it. And I just want to be clear, I would never recommend to any of you guys that you uh, try to sneak through a, a, you know, a sovereign border or the border of a sovereign country in any circumstance, but this was a really highly unusual one. So there's the logistical. Then there's also the security challenges. This was an incredibly dangerous war to cover, probably the most dangerous war I have ever covered. Um, you're not really supposed to be there. There is no sense of, you know, like the Assad regime was actively targeting journalists. They certainly weren't interested in trying to protect um, impartial observers or, you know, non-combatants. Um, I think they saw us as combatants and probably still do. So it was incredibly dangerous, difficult to get around, um, you know, bombs falling from the sky all the time, people dying all around you. Uh, it's incredibly chaotic, very difficult from a technology point of view. You don't have like consistent electricity. The internet was terrible. How do you get your pieces out? And on and on and on. And then there's the real challenge of like, how do you go home after spending a week in Aleppo and seeing people getting pulverized into the rubble day in and day out? How do you then like go home and go on vacation with your family and your friends to like the South of France? And like, how is that okay? Like, how do, how do we live in a world where that's okay, where I'm allowed to leave and go and have this beautiful vacation and all those people left behind, sorry, I'm gonna get rid of this. 
that's my mother actually i have so sure i told her not to call but you know what mothers are like um so how do you um how do you process that that's not an easy thing to process um there's a lot of guilt associated with surviving um things like this and so for a number of reasons it's a hugely draining um uh, area to cover. But at the same time, if you're smart about it and you're hardworking and you're passionate and you're getting therapy in between uh, rotations and, you know, taking good care of your security, then it's also incredibly satisfying and, and profoundly important work. You're bearing witness. And that is in its best and most beautiful moments with this job. Like that is like you're bearing witness, you're writing a first draft of history and, and, and that's a profound responsibility and, and also a real privilege. So we students got to examine yellow journalism um, that occurred in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, do you see connections uh, with that and today's like fake news? Um, Tell me what you mean by yellow journalism exactly, sorry. Yellow journalism was like the competing of uh, stories, but then adding like fake information within okay. those stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, sadly, I think what's happening today is uh, even more disturbing because what we're seeing today is there are people who are actively and willfully and knowingly disseminating disinformation. And there is a growing portion of the population that is seemingly willing to, uh, to eat it up and to accept it with great credulity and very little, I mean, very little in terms of having a critical eye. And that is enormously, enormously, it's enormously frightening because when you have a society that is so bombarded with disinformation and misinformation, uh, what ultimately happens is that people kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, you know what, I don't even know. Like there's no such thing as truth, right? Maybe there's just no, it, there's like, everyone has a different truth. The real truth doesn't exist. And therefore let's just throw in the towel and forget it. And societies that do that, that kind of willingly surrender to the idea that there isn't, you know, that there aren't principles, that there isn't truth, that there aren't facts. They are incredibly vulnerable to totalitarian regimes. And we've seen this again and again, and Hannah Arendt wrote about this in Nazi Germany. Like this is a big part of what happened. So, when we talk about like fake news, like some people might just laugh because it's like, oh, what a ridiculous, like how could anyone believe that story or whatever, but actually underlying it is something much more sinister, which is a deliberate attempt uh, on behalf of certain parties to muddy the waters to the point where you create social turbulence, where you um, fuel divisions, create hatred. And as I said, sort of, erase this notion that we all should share and believe in that there are certain fundamental truths and, and certainly that there are fundamental facts, right? I'm not talking about the fact that we're all biased because of course everyone brings their unique journey and their unique upbringing and all of that to the table when they're storytelling. And they may inject a certain flavor and they may have a certain bias and that's okay as long as you have this grounding in facts, as long as it's not like magical thinking, it's like actual, okay, my perspective might be different from yours than this, but we're both talking about the, the facts of, of what happened or what we know happened or what we know is physically humanly possible or whatever it might be. So this is something that concerns me hugely. And, um, I feel like it's sort of a Pandora's box that has been opened and it's the ugly side of social media as we know that often those voices that are disseminating that kind of misinformation are the ones that are being amplified. Um, and this creates this like growing dichotomies of extremism. 
So this is why I say to all of you that now more than ever, we really need journalists and uh, who are like committed to the facts, you know, to the basic facts and to the basic ethics of this profession. You know, you have to have two sources. You can't just make something up. If you look at a lot of the media right now, it's like these people are not even going to these places. They're sitting in some room in whatever, you know, outside of London, writing articles about how Bashar al-Assad never used chemical weapons against his own people. And it's like, for those of us who are going to the places where these chemical weapons were used and like doing interviews on the ground and get like, it's it's infuriating because it's like, you can't compare. <laughs> you can't compare. And so this is the other thing I think we have to be a little careful about sometimes we, historically think of journalism being like on the one hand and on the other hand, you know, but no, it's not the same to be like on the one hand, this journalist who's like gone on the ground and like interviewed survivors and taken samples for scientists and like filmed, you know, evidence of this on their camera phones or whatever. On the other hand, this chick who like, you know, writes about nutty conspiracy theories on her blog from, you know, out, no, it's not the same thing. It doesn't carry the same equivalence. So at the same time, I recognize that journalists face a lot of challenges as well. And we really need to step up to the plate and we need to be more honest about our own biases because frankly, it's not the end of the world as long as we can all agree on like basic facts and everyone, I would always encourage them to be seeking out multiple sources of news. So, you know, you're not just gonna read the New York Times. You, you might wanna read other publications as well and, and get a different, perspective that's great but you know when you're talking about like info wars with alex jones like that's dangerous that's not great that's nothing to do with journalism whatsoever and unfortunately we have a lot of work to do to counter the idea that it's like on the one hand they have their media and we have ours it's like no it's a one is a form of bizarre entertainment i guess and one is journalism and so we recently covered uh, the Sedition Act in America and what it meant during World War I um, and how it counteracted with uh, the civilians' freedom of speech and the press's freedom of speech. What do you think is um, your opinion on the limits of the freedom of speech, the freedom of speech, if any? Yeah, I mean, look, this is such a good question and it's a really hard one and nobody has all the answers. I think that you, I mean, really you could do like an entire seminar on this topic. I just think that people have to understand that there are two sides to everything. So of course, a lot of people were delighted when Twitter decided to kick Donald Trump off its platform, right? I mean, many, many people were delighted. But what was interesting to me was that there's a, the opposition leader in Russia, Alexei Navalny, who I have covered very closely. And I actually was part of a team that exposed the FSB operatives who tried to kill him with Novichok poison back in August. And Navalny actually survived that poisoning. And uh, after being taken to Germany in a coma, he went back to Russia. He was arrested, of course, immediately, and he's been sentenced to two years and eight months in a penal colony in the middle of nowhere. In the midst of all this, Alexei Navalny comes out on Twitter and does a kind of long and honestly pretty articulate Twitter thread about why he views the removal of Donald Trump from Twitter as being so dangerous. And, it, and, and when you first start to read it, you're like, wait, why would Navalny be, you know, because you'd think that Navalny in many ways would, would dislike Trump, right? But that's got nothing to do with it. It's not about whether you like Trump or not, or whether you like this voice or not. It's about, uh, in his eyes, in this particular instance, how can this model be appropriated around the world and used against people who are maybe trying to do good, right? So his argument was the same um, sort of rhetorical device or the same argument that was being used to remove Donald Trump from Twitter was the exact same argument that Vladimir Putin uses to prevent Navalny from 
appearing on state television, running in elections and being allowed basically to be a member of the opposition. Now, nobody is saying that, you know, Twitter is the equivalent of Vladimir Putin. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that things that you, that we do in, as a society in a very certain moment can always be appropriated and used in a different context. It's still the same tool, right? And so when you're talking about taking away someone's freedom of speech, there's always going to be a very complicated argument around it because any dictator knows the old great adage, which is that whoever is your enemy, they're a terrorist. Okay, that's the first, that's, that's like 101 of being a dictator. Okay, I'm in power, this is great. And then someone's like, we want freedom. And it's like, you're a terrorist. Because the minute I call you a terrorist, the minute I say you're inciting violence, we're seeing it again in Myanmar, by the way. It's like, oh, um, these guys have been coming out and protesting every day because there was a military coup and all of their you know, democratic rights are being rolled back and they're coming out in peacefully in the streets and uh, the military is like, you're, you're, you're behaving like terrorists and there's gonna be loss of life unless you stop. So this is a very powerful rhetorical device that is used again and again to, to silence people. And so we just have to keep in mind that wherever you stand on, on, on the sort of freedom of speech, that what you, the way you apply it at home is also the way it will be used overseas and abroad. And the language you use at home to describe the other, uh, whether that be a terrorist, whether that be a person of a different political persuasion, that language will also be co-opted by people who are maybe more authoritarian, less responsible or whatever it is. So I think it's a very important debate to have. I don't think there is a clear um, right and wrong on this. I think there's really strong arguments for both sides. But I think the most important thing is to have the conversation. And the one thing that concerns me a little bit in the US at the moment is there's this real kind of knee jerk, like we can't even have that conversation because you're such an idiot or you're such a racist or you're such a homophobe or you're such a transphobe or you're such a ignoramus or you know it's a microaggression or, or whatever it is that like, it's like immediately shutting down the conversation. And ultimately, when you go out of the United States and travel in the rest of the world, you realize that like that's a bubble and that's not the way the rest of the world operates. And we have to be willing not to embrace other people's values, but to accept the fact that different people have different values. And, and that doesn't necessarily have to threaten our own values. And we should be able to, from a position of strength, have hard conversations um, about uh, our values and, and why we have them. And, and I understand that in the US right now, it's really devolved into you know, really nasty dehumanizing language and mudslinging and it's become super ugly. So I do understand why people don't want to engage in it. But as someone who's covered war for many years, I can tell you that it's always better to verbally engage in painful conversations than to let these things fester and blow up into something much more serious that is much harder to deal with with words. Takeaway is really like understanding people's perspectives and then trying to find common ground where there is some. <laughs> um, yeah, and just remembering that like listen, there are some really evil people out there in the world, right? Like, uh, let's use the Syria example. Like Bashar al-Assad is an evil man. He is an evil man, okay? But like, is every single Syrian who supports Bashar al-Assad evil? No, that's ludicrous, okay? Like it's war. People are a product of their upbringing. People are a product of the context that they're living in. People are cowardly. People are scared for their families. People are, you know, whatever. There's a thousand different reasons that people end up uh, tacitly or explicitly supporting things that we can all agree are like heinous, okay? It doesn't mean that every single one of them is evil. And I just, I just, I think we have to be really careful about being so dismissive of entire swaths of any population. And, 
back in May when we first spoke, you were, you had just covered, I think, the Oxford vaccines and the trials. And how do you think reporting on the pandemic um, has changed your life as a journalist, but also civilians who are watching it on TV or who are reading it? I mean, I feel like the pandemic is very, very difficult to cover. I think that the journalists who bring the most to the table in covering it are people like, we're very lucky at CNN to have Dr. Sanjay Gupta who bring their medical expertise in addition to their natural ability as communicators to make things digestible. Um, for me personally, you know, I mean, I was like heavily pregnant during COVID and stuff. So I couldn't go and do the kinds of stories that I wouldn't normally want to do, which would be to go in the ICUs, go to the worst hit areas, go to Iran, Brazil, the places where it was really spreading like wildfire out of control. Um, and I think many of us were really faced with this challenge of like, how do you cover a war? Because, okay, it's not a conventional war, but it's, it's a war in a sense. How do you cover a war from your living room? where a lot of the fighting is taking place in ICUs that you can't get access to because the hospitals are nervous about you seeing it. And even if you can get access, you have to blur the faces of every single person in there for privacy reasons. So it's extremely challenging. Um, and I think if I was still, I'm not really actively covering COVID except for occasionally. If I was covering it right now, and had to deal with the whole anti-vaxxer phenomenon. I mean, I don't, I don't know how I would deal with that because that must be really frustrating when you are working hard covering the incredible uh, work that scientists and doctors are doing to try to end this horrendous, you know, going on more than a year now. And people again are just being bombarded with misinformation and disinformation that leads them to conclude they shouldn't get vaccinated. That makes it much more difficult to make our society safe. Uh, I think that's really frustrating and challenging as a, as, as a, as a journalist. And, but all you can do is just keep putting the facts out there. We've got kind of a related question in, in the Q&A um, that I wanted to, to pose to you, if I could. Uh, what do you think the future of journalism will look like because of growing distrust in the media? Well, I mean, I want to be positive about it. So what I hope the future of journalism looks like is a much broader and more diverse uh, selection of voices telling stories. And I think we are definitely starting to see that, but we have a lot more work to do and a lot further to go because, you know, that representation is hugely important and sort of like really encompassing um, the whole of, of what people are thinking and feeling and experiencing. So I wanna see a much more dynamic, vibrant and diverse journalist core. I wanna see more women over the age of 50 on television. <laughs> Um, and I want to see, you know, I would love to see some faith in mainstream media restored because at the end of the day, while I am so in awe of like a lot of the incredible work that freelancers are doing, that um, bloggers are doing and podcasters are doing and, and all of, I mean, it's like some of the most exceptional work being done, but they don't have the resources to, deploy people like CNN does to, you know, half the countries of the world and, and make sure that those stories are being told. Like that's a hugely vital service, even from just a bare bones, like this is information, knowledge is power. We need to have people all over the world collecting information and, and, and providing it back to us in a sort of, you know, in a, in a digestible, accessible, and coherent way. So I would love to see that. I would love to see mainstream media adapt more to the, the growing changes in our world. And I would love to see our world learn to embrace um, 
the value of mainstream media and the very real public service uh, that, that journalists provide. Um, but I am cognizant that there are huge challenges. And I guess this is a good time to segue into our Q&A. Um, and there's one really good question, which if you guys go read the book, you'll learn more about it, but is, what people that you've met in the course of your career especially impacted you? So I had a wonderful driver in Syria, a lovely, lovely man called Ayman. And Ayman was incredibly gentle and incredibly low key, which when you're in a very dangerous, hectic place, it's such a tonic. Um, and it's very soothing to have someone like that with your with your group because you're spending weeks on end together in, in difficult and distressing situations. And Eamon and I were in Aleppo and I remember I was like scared out of my mind. It was so, so scary. It was just like constant bombardment. And I was sitting in the car with him waiting for the cameraman and the producer were shooting something. And he could see how scared I was and he was trying to like talk to me to make me feel better. And then he gave me a little bit of chocolate, which was like such a small act of kindness. And it, I really wasn't even hungry. I didn't feel like the chocolate, but just the way he gave it to me was, um, it calmed me. It made me feel safe. It was, um, it was a really lovely moment. And that was what Eamon was amazing at. I remember another time waking up at 5 a.m. and we were all sleeping on the floor and we could hear the fighter jets like overhead. And it's awful when you can hear the fighter jets overhead because you know there's gonna drop a bomb somewhere. And you know, you'd probably be really unlucky if it falls on you, but still it's like, you know, it's petrifying. And I looked over at him to see, I was seeing who else was awake. And I looked over and he just kind of went like, yeah. <laughs> Like, what are you going to do about it? Well, actually, what he was sort of saying is Allahu Alam, which is like only God knows in Islam. Um, but I just, I loved being around Ayman. And he had a difficult life. He had uh, seven or eight children. And there was no money in Syria because of the war. And he was feeling like he was going to have to marry off his 15-year-old uh, daughter, which he really didn't want to do. But he couldn't afford to feed all his children and he just was a lovely lovely guy and you know anyway uh in 2015 he was visiting a friend of his in a hospital near the border and uh it was hit by a russian airstrike and Amon was killed so um yeah that was very hard and um unfortunately when you do this job you have a lot of people in your life like that but Eamon was definitely someone who, with very small gestures and few words, taught me a lot about kindness. That was really powerful. Um, what other questions? Yeah, it's a good one here about uh, what advantages, if any, do you see in covering international relations as opposed to covering strictly American politics or domestic conflicts? Yeah, that is a good question. I mean, I really think it's down to you and what interests you. Uh, that, like, I take my hats, my hat even, singular, my hat off to my domestic colleagues who cover U.S. politics, who covered this last, pre last presidential election. Like, I don't know how they could have done it. Okay, to me... I would rather be in Syria, definitely. Like way, I, I, it's a totally different skill set. It's a totally different set of stresses as well. And man, it is stressful and it's hostile in a different way. You're not gonna get shot probably, although you know nowadays that's increasingly being called into question. So um, I think it's just about what inspires and excites you and what makes you curious. And perhaps because I'm half British and half American, and I lived half my life here in the UK. And then my dad moved to Hong Kong when I was 14. I just always felt drawn to international. I was always into like, ex I love this idea of getting to places that no one else can get to. But if your thing is covering, you know, domestic policy or covering wildfires and get it doesn't really matter. Like whatever your passion is, that's where you should, that's where you should follow. Um, 
trying to read through the questions because there's a lot of good ones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> touch with um, the people that you have worked with on past stories um, or um, I know one of your colleagues Arwa Damon um, has kept in touch with some and she's done a TED talk on it where she speaks um, more about yeah. it but yeah it's a really good specific question ones? Um, that really out to you. It's very difficult um, because there's so many stories and so many people and, you know, writing phone numbers on little slips of paper that get lost or notebooks that disappear and phone numbers change and people move. And uh, I think social media has made it a lot easier. So a lot of these people will follow me on Instagram or I follow them. And it just means that, yeah, we can, we can be in touch and we can talk. And there's definitely um, a few people from every, certainly every war I've covered who I'm, who I'm absolutely in touch with. And, you know, Arwa, who you mentioned, my colleague, I mean, is particularly extraordinary because she also started this whole NGO out of her work because she kept meeting children in conflict zones with complex medical needs as a result of injuries they had sustained in these conflict zones. And she felt like really that it was her responsibility or, or, or that she wanted to be able to try to help them and hook them up with the best medical care. And, um, and CNN supported her in that initiative. And so she started this charity in Auto which I mean, obviously you're involved with this as well. And I'm sure you guys have all heard about it, but it's really an exceptional charity because it's like, if you know Arwa, like she's a hundred percent real and there's no, you know, nonsense with overheads and fancy bowls and no, no, this is like about Arwa being out in the field, meeting people and helping them. And um, I think that's what makes her a very, very uh, dear friend of mine, a very special human being. But I would say for the most part, she's unique in that way. She really, really, really cares. And there are some of us who care, but there's also a lot of people who just have to take a slightly more detached approach. We have club meetings <laughs> once every two weeks, if you guys wanna come. Um... So you're talking about having that hands-off approach as a question in the Q&A that, that ties into that. Uh, do journalists have to take an impartial approach to a situation when they encounter it? For example, how does one document the atrocities in Syria when it seems so one-sided? Yeah, and this is a really important question. And um, I think as a news organization, you need to have both sides covered, right? You need to have someone in the regime territories giving it from Bashar al-Assad's perspective, giving it from the people who supports him uh, from their perspective, like that's really important. Um, and also, by the way, interviewing those people and saying, what the hell are you doing here, right? Because someone like me covering the other side has no access to, to the government. Um, and you need someone with the rebels telling that side of the story. At the same time, it, look, when I'm covering the rebels, I'm covering what I'm seeing and like, I'm not gonna try to minimize the suffering or the drama or the horror or the bloodshed in order to make it look like I'm giving both sides equal weight, you know, because that I just don't see that frankly as being my job. I feel like my job is to like give you this, this is what's happening over here. And this is the way it looks from over here. And this is how people feel here. And this is what the air smells like here. And this is what I'm witnessing. And these are these people's stories. And so, yes, it's essential to have somebody on the other side doing the same thing. But no, I don't think it makes sense for me to be like, well, I just saw like two children killed. But, you know, you know, the, the regime claims also that, you know, a civilian was killed today in a rocket. No, that's it, it doesn't make sense. I should stick to talking about what I'm seeing for myself and, 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 and the same goes the other way around.
a good one. What is your favorite thing about your job as a journalist? Oh my God, so many things. I mean, I said like front row seat on history, <sighs> adventure. It's a lot of adventure. It's like parts of it, even war. And I don't want this to be misunderstood, but like it can be really fun because it's challenging and you're with a great group of people and you're like kind of in the dirt together, like, you know, making it work and, and figuring out a way to hustle and get across the country and find a ride and blah, 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 blah. So there's a kind of camaraderie and excitement uh, that comes with doing this kind of work. It can be lots of fun, um, exhausting and stressful and harrowing, but like you have to be able to laugh as well or else you, you could, I mean, not in certain moments, obviously, but the other thing I think people don't realize about covering war specifically is like, you know, there's like exciting, crazy danger for maybe 5% of the time. 95% of the time is like a lot of tedium, a lot of boredom, a lot of long eight hour drives across the country or waiting for a ride or waiting for a plane or what, you know, there's a lot of killing time. And that's true whether you're a war correspondent or whether you're a soldier, like killing time is, you know, 90% of the game in, in terms of war. Um, so I love that. And I just love meeting people who and connecting with people who I would never normally meet with. You know, I talk in the end of my book about going out to Afghanistan and I was like one of the very few Western journalists to go and like live with the Taliban for a couple of days. And so I was sleeping in this room with Taliban wives and children and, you know, and I was connecting with these women and having beautiful moments and rubbing moisturizer into their face. They'd never seen moisturizer before and they were kind of staring at me when I was putting it on. And so I went around the room and gave them all moisturizer. We couldn't speak the same language. We couldn't communicate, but like, that was beautiful. That was profound. That that will stay in my heart for, for my whole life. And like, I'm so blessed that I get paid to do that. Like what? Like. I feel like I have the best job in the world. <laughs> um, and I don't wanna minimize the, the challenges of it because there are a number of them. And especially when you become a mother like I am, it's, it's tricky. It's a, there's a lot of balancing acts that are in play. But to be honest, I think that no matter what your job is, if you're really passionate and consumed about it, it's always tough to get that mom work balance just right. Let's finish off. Um, what are your thoughts on athletes expressing their political opinions during sporting events? I mean, to be honest, I don't think that's something I've ever really given a huge amount of thought to. Uh, <clears throat> I Look, here's what I think. I think we live in a country where you can talk about your political beliefs whenever you want to, okay? So if you wanna, if you feel inspired, if you feel passionate um, and you're doing it in a way that's respectful um, and not like dehumanizing or demon, demonizing, then sure. I mean, that's your right. Who am I to tell you that you can't do that or you shouldn't do that? Um, it, would be, it would be completely ludicrous. Now, if you're a journalist, it's different. You, you really can't be doing that. Um, and even though it's clear that certain journalists lean certain ways politically, um, I do think it's still really important to not have it become like an overt sort of blurring of the lines between activism and journalism or activism and politics and journalism. And so, but if you work in sports, you know, I mean, at the same time, you gotta be willing to like game out all the potential eventualities of that. Um, and, 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 you know, what that could mean for, for your career. And I also think it's, I mean, I just watched the Tiger Woods documentary and I thought it was interesting when he was talking about like, he came under a lot of pressure to be more political than he actually was. And that to me feels, I mean, I understand how it came about because of the huge significance of having a person of color become this huge star in a sport that had been like an old middle-class white guys game for like ever. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't feel that people should be forced to take or adapt political stances that don't necessarily feel totally natural to them. 
Um, but that's just my personal opinion based on watching the Tiger Woods documentary, which I thoroughly enjoyed by the way. <laughs> um, and I hope he makes a speedy recovery, but yeah, that's, that's, that's all I got on that one. <laughs> well, I think that wraps our whole, um, webinar. Um, Miss CG, do you want to add anything more? No, I, I just a huge thank you for spending the time talking to us today and really kind of bringing your, you know, feet on the ground perspective on media and the challenges that are facing this this industry and so thankful that that you're there on the ground and uh, thankful for you giving giving the time for us today. Thank you so much, guys. I've really enjoyed chatting to all of you. And you. we'll just send in any other questions that you guys have um, within the next week or so. Um, Sounds good. But great, thanks. thank you. It was, it was wonderful being able to bridge some of our content with, with what it's like on in, in the real world as, as a journalist, so, <laughs> so thank you for that. Okay, thanks guys. Go forth and conquer. <laughs> Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Okay.